started a recording on this session. Uh, I want to wish everyone a happy summer, and I don't really have a whole lot of preamble here today, so we're going to kind of jump right in to today's topic. Uh, we're kind of after the last few months of going around the edges of AIX with some different um, specialties. We're kind of jumping today into something that's probably uh, near and dear to most people that are using AIX, and that would be uh, high availability. Now, whether you use something else or Power HA, um, certainly Power HA is IBM's preferred way to do this. So today we've got Mike Herrera, who's joining us to present how to design a Power HA solution um, for System Mirror Solution for AIX. So Mike, uh, a few things about Mike. He's been with IBM for 17 years. Uh, was actually a uh, uh, he's in the Power System Strategic Initiatives Group, it's what we used to know as ATS. Uh, before he was uh, an escalation contact for what was then HACMP, um, now rebranded as Power HA. So Mike's been around doing this for a long time. He's co-authored Red Books. Uh, he's presented Power HA for years at various conferences, including Edge. So Mike has a lot of experience in this field, and. Uh, uh, we're going to turn it over to him, um, but just as a last thing, I, I am, as I said, recording this, so I'll put a replay up on the AIX Bug Wiki. The materials, the presentation materials, are already out on the AIX Bug Wiki, and you can download those at any time. So with that, Mike, uh, you're already the presenter. Your screen is up, and I can see it, so I'll hand it over to you. All right, super. Thank you for the uh, intro, and uh, hello, everyone. I uh, was asked by Joe to go ahead and deliver a presentation covering some of the uh, cluster design aspects, uh, some of the new features, and then some of the current issues that I'm actually seeing. So the agenda that I laid out kind of covers the things that you're seeing on the screen. I'll touch on uh, a couple things on the product offering, some of the different topologies that you can configure with the cluster, some licensing issues. Um, I'll be happy to take questions at the tail end of the session if you have anything pressing type it into the uh, Q&A section. Joe, if you can answer it, go for it. If not, I'm more than happy to uh, try to address those at the tail end. And then my information is at the very front page of the presentation. So if you guys have any follow-up questions, feel free to uh, email them to me and I'm, I'll be happy to respond. Um, so you see the line items that I'm going to be touching on. Um, one of the things I should probably level set with is, is that we have a number of different releases that we've come out with over the last few years. Uh, the most recent one came out last December, the HA7-2 release. Um, it does not have significant internal changes, and it does play on the different releases that you see on the top left of the screen. So I get a lot of questions about does it run on this particular version of AIX. The levels that I have outlined on this chart are the minimum levels that you need to install the software. So if you're not at AIX 61 TL9, um, it just won't be able to install. Uh, same thing with TL, uh, 7.1 TL3. Uh, it also works with TL4 and AI 7.2. And then if you work your way down the stack, you'll see that the 7.1.3 release is still supported. It carries support until 2017. Um, and then 7.1.2, 7.1.1, 7.1.0, and 6.1 are out of support. We do have a number of clients that are lingering on 6.1. It was the last release that played with AI 5.3. Um, so if you had any lingering environments, you could potentially still be playing with 6.1. I believe that extended support carried until sometime in 2018. So if you needed to stay back for whatever reason, um, you could do so. The other thing I'd like to contrast here, the early V7 releases all the way up to the 7.1.2 release required IP multicasting enabled on your Layer 2 devices, whether it was for the VLANs that you were using or at the global level. Starting in the 7.1.3 release, so the current stable points today will unicast by default. So you do not have to worry about that IP multicast requirement. If you wanted to exploit that functionality, you could, but you do not have to and you're not forced to do so from the get-go. So, I mean, I, I've had a number of clients looking at uh, deploys. Maybe they're playing with older versions of AIX as far as technology levels are concerned. And... Uh, you know, sometimes it's a little bit painful to get the AIX updates in place, but you save yourself potential headaches if you don't have to deal with the multicast requirements and things of the sort. So uh, current stable points would be 713 or 720. As I go through the presentation, I will highlight some of the new features in 72. And then at the very tail end of the session, uh, after, you know, we, we conclude, I had a couple of uh, backup charts that have 
the outlined new features in the 7.2 release if you wanted to specifically see what was in the uh, very latest release. So going forward, uh, the way that our product is basically broken up and has been repackaged since the 6.1 release, we broke it up into a standard edition and an enterprise edition. So the standard edition is what most clients typically associate with local clustering. We support all the way up to 16 nodes. We used to go up to 32, but we changed back to 16 when we moved up to uh, relying on cluster aware AIX for our internals. And then the enterprise edition is what gives you the integration with different replication offerings. So if you needed automated failover between the sites, you have a couple choices as far as how you get the data from point A to point B. One of them would be our GLVM offering, which comes as part of AIX, but to automate it, you need Power HA. So that would be our host-based IP replication solution. And then we have integration with a number of different copy services mechanisms. So Metro Mirror, Global Mirror, uh, EMC's SRDF, Hitachi True Copy, and HUR. If you needed to automate those guys, the Enterprise Edition pillar on the right-hand side is what actually makes sense for your environment. If you don't have a need to automate those things, the standard edition on the left will suffice. Uh, this is pretty, you know, HA101 are pretty basic, but the things that I do like to highlight are on the bottom left of the chart. Um, even though you may only have the standard edition, you can still put site definitions into the, your cluster configurations. So I highlight that um, on the bottom bullets. We support a maximum of two sites, and you might be wondering, hey, if these guys are next to each other or within the same data center, sharing, sharing the same storage, what's the incentive to define sites with a local cluster config? So the incentive would be if system one is sitting on one network segment, system two is, is in a different network segment, for years now you've had the ability to define site-specific IPs. So you might have a service IP that works on one network segment, and then if your workload moves and it's in a different network segment, that IP is not going to be of any use to you. So it makes sense to have a second IP address defined, tag it with the second site name, put them both in the same resource group, and then if your workload moves, it'll bring the IP that works on that particular site. Um, so that would be one potential incentive to put site definitions. The additional incentives to have site definitions in your cluster configuration include some of the new split and merge policies that we came out with a couple years ago. So you have the concept of tiebreaker disks. Uh, you have the concept of a manual split and merge policy that it would effectively give you user confirmation on failover. If you don't put site definitions into your cluster config, you cannot use those options. Oftentimes, clients associated with a DR configuration, but those features can be exploited in a local setup if you define the cluster topology with site definitions. And I have a couple charts that will expand on that as far as the new cluster topologies that are available. You can have a standard cluster, you can have a stretched cluster, and you can have a linked cluster. So I'll highlight the differences in a few more charts. So as far as you know, the, the standard edition, the base foundation that you need for the product to install started being included as part of the base AIX images uh, starting in AIX 6.1 TL6. Base AIX 7 already has them in there, so you see the packages up, up on top. Those are the ones that provide the cluster aware AIX infrastructure. Those guys should already be in place. And then if you install the standard edition, what you do is you get a number of different packages. You can opt to install them all and just forget about it. I typically install the ones in the reddish pinkish color, and then the bottom ones I consider kind of as optional if I want to go ahead and exploit those features. That would basically let me create the cluster shell, have the SMIT panels, and perform the manipulation of the cluster configuration. Um, one of the questions that I get a lot of is, okay, I go ahead and I install either the latest release or you know, uh, one of the previous releases, but Am I at the right service pack? Uh, are there any critical fixes that I should load? What's a good cluster stable point? So what our development team did is they put together a link, and I have the URL on the bottom, and I have it in the uh, references at the tail end of the presentation. So if you go to that link, what you'll see is a number of different tables uh, kind of formatted in this fashion. Uh, I did update the dates, so they, they were recently updated as far as the packages that you can download. If you are running one of those specific AIX releases on the table on top or one of the HA releases that I'm showing on the bottom and you click on the link, what it'll get you is additional bundles beyond that service pack that include a number of interim fixes that our development team is aware of that they recommend that you have in place. 
So not only are you maybe running, like on the bottom, HA7-2, Service Pack 1, but in addition to Service Pack 1, you might actually consider loading this bundle. So for example, I went ahead and I pulled down one of the actual bundles for AI714 SP1. And if you take a look at the readme that you pull down, it tells you, hey, there's two different eManager packages out there. I took a peek inside of the very first one, and you can see you know, the outline of the different fixes that are included in, in the first portion, the CAA fixes. So again, you can do that for any of the packages. You're not forced to install them. These are not required fixes, but they are highly recommended for you to be at good stable points. So if you were not aware of the site, that is definitely a good reference point to go to. And you don't have to install. You can take a peek and see if those fixes are of use to you or if you really want to take the time to load them. Uh, as far as local cluster setups, we typically associate our configurations either in an active standby configuration, like I'm showing on the very top. You might have a mutual takeover config, like I'm showing in the middle, for the uh, LPARs A2 and B2. So you might have two different application instances, and you don't have an idle standby, so both servers or both LPARs are providing protection for each other. Or uh, I, I get asked a lot about active-active configurations. We support an active active in a concurrent fashion it's like i'm showing with lpars uh, a3 and b3 if you put a volume group in a concurrent resource group meaning that it's online and all nodes we only support it where there are no file systems inside of that volume group so you would only be able to play with raw logical volumes now if your application can exploit that then it makes sense to go ahead and load it in place um, you can think of active active as the middle scenario where you have two different instances on both sides of the cluster are providing protection for a, a specific workload. So it doesn't necessarily have to be truly concurrent. So I often have to clarify, hey, what do you mean by active-active? Do you mean in a concurrent fashion, where you're gonna be hitting it from all sides at the same time for the same exact workload? Or do you mean active-active in the sense that both sides are doing something? So keep that in consideration when you're doing your planning. Um, as far as the cluster features, I mean, we can get pretty granular. We can set failback policies to fail back on a Saturday at 2 a.m. instead of failing back automatically if you wanted to get that fancy. But I mean, we have all sorts of things like resource group dependencies, different monitors that you can put in place. I can create custom events uh, where I can have entry points in the cluster processing that will say, perform this logic before starting up my applications, right? So if you needed to have something custom that you didn't want to plug into the application start script, you know, you, you've got the capability to do so, and you've had that capability for many years. We can manipulate the size of the LPARs whenever we activate the application workloads. So we've had integrated the LPAR capabilities for a number of years, where I can do the setup like I have on the top cluster, where I have uh, A1 and B1. So if B1 is running, actually, I could set up both of my LPARs to be running skinny on boot. And then when HA services start up, based on where the workload's being hosted, I can go ahead and have it get expanded. So the integrated DLPAR functions that we had in the past only played with resources in the free shared processor pool. Um, we have beefed that up even further, where now we have uh, integration with COD, whether it's for processors or memory, or with Power Enterprise pools, which I highlighted in the blue color. So the latest release, HA7.2, if you have enterprise class servers, Power 7 Plus or the uh, uh, Power 8 machines, you can have HA fully integrate with Power Enterprise pools and perform the automation of those mobile activations whenever the uh, resources are being acquired. So I put a video on YouTube that shows how that integration works. Again, I I'll highlight that a little bit further as I go throughout the remainder of the presentation. Um, as far as supported resource configs, you can be playing with fully dedicated resources. You can be fully virtualized. We don't care if it's NPIV, virtual SCSI, shared storage pools. Um, we certainly play well with live partition mobility. There are some considerations as far as LPM is concerned. The latest release, HA7.2, has been updated so that if you perform an LPM operation outside of the cluster, uh, the cluster manager now is aware that that LPM operation is taking place, and it will automatically disable a number of things and it, automat it will automatically re-enable them as soon as the LPM operation completes. So there's a new level of awareness with the latest release. Um, if you're not running the latest release, you can do those things manually when you initiate the LPM operation, and I'll highlight those things at, towards the tail end of the presentation, and you'll see those guys uh, as well. 
Same thing with AI 7.2. The latest release, HA 7.2, does have a level of uh, live update awareness. So if you're performing a live update operation on the system that's actually hosting the production workload, and the whole point is not to have to reboot the kernel, when you switch over to the surrogate LPAR, I sure would hate to trigger a failover. I'm clustered, yes, but I take a hit if my application moves and goes offline and then comes back up. So again, just like with live partition mobility, HA7.2, the cluster manager is aware that that live update operation has taken place. It'll automatically disable a number of things and re-enable them as soon as the operation is complete so that it does not trigger an actual failover. So that's how the, the color-coded things are the things that I tried to highlight that are available with the latest release. So I put a, a few reminders as I go through the presentation just to make sure that I highlight some of the new features available with the product. And then on the bottom, as far as shared storage is concerned in, in a local cluster setup, anything supported by AIX is supported by PowerHA. So you don't have to wait for a, you know, some type of flash to come out saying, oh, EMC came out with this new storage subsystem. If it's supported by AIX, it's supported by our cluster software. Uh, a while back, and I'm, I'm talking years ago, we had some limitations with early version 7 releases as far as OEM multipath drivers. Today, that's a wash. So whether it's PowerPath, HDLM, MPIO, it doesn't matter. We can play well with them in a local cluster setup. So you don't care about a certification flash or a test flash unless you're playing with the Enterprise Edition and you wanted to automate the integration with copy services replication. Then you would care about a flash. Uh, but in a local setup like I'm showing here, it's a wash. If it's supported by AIX, it's supported by PowerHA. If we were to look at the Enterprise Edition, so I showed you the packages for a local cluster setup a couple charts ago. So if I were to load the Enterprise Edition, I get all the local packages, and in addition to that, I get a number of additional packages for each of the different replication offerings that we provide integration with. So I highlight the one for the uh, store-wise enclosures in the middle. I, I have it set up in the lab, so I mean, I could install just those guys and the local packages, uh, or I can I could install everything. So the key thing is, is that when I install those packages, if you look at the bottom of the chart that I just loaded, you get extra entry points in the SMIT panels where you can go ahead and define those uh, source and target storage subsystems, and then those source and target LUN replication definitions are also going to be, become part of the cluster configuration. So you don't get that unless you install those extra enterprise edition packages. Again, you can install the one specific through the storage subsystems that you're using, or you could install everything and get all the extra SMIT panels. Um, it's tiny, I mean, as far as uh, the amount of code and space that you're consuming, so you're not necessarily burning that much space, but I could have just as easily loaded only the license package up on top, and then the SDC or the store-wise packages to get those SMIT panels. Now, if I install those guys, I could have a setup like I'm showing here. I might have site definitions in my cluster where I have site one and site two. At my first site, I, if they're going to be relatively far away, um, I may want to take, into, take that into account and have a local availability configuration first where I have, you know, LPAR1 hosting my production workload, I have a viable local failover target, and then I have a viable failover target at the remote site. Now, to keep the data in sync between site one and site two, on the bottom, I'm reflecting that I might have synchronous or asynchronous replication. The distance between the two sites are going to kind of make the decision as to what's going to make sense to deploy in your config. We can integrate with one or the other, uh, so the setup is not much different. Um, a lot of times we get clients saying, hey, can I just have a single member? Can I have that A1 on the top left, and can I have that C1 on the right and totally skip B1? Sure but that usually makes more sense if you're replicating synchronously between the two locations as opposed to asynchronously. If you're gonna be doing asynchronous replication between the sites, it probably makes more sense to have a viable local standby so that you have a local failover take place first if something happens to the production LPAR, and then that way you only lose the in-flight transactions on the shared disks at that site, and then you may still be replicating to the remote location and still have DR protection. But again, a local failover when you're replicating asynchronously is not exactly the same as a DR failover from one site to the next, right? The data will be consistent because of the built-in consistency groups with the copy services replication, 
but it could be behind. So again, that, that's where it makes sense to potentially have a local cluster. I purposely at the top set up my standby LPARs skinny because if you already know that those standby LPARs are not going to be doing anything, they're just sitting there waiting to take over, you don't necessarily have to consume all those licenses or pay for all those licenses. I might need 10 processors worth of processing power on the top left for A1, but if B1 is just sitting there not doing anything, maybe I set them up with only one. And same thing with C1 on the top right. That way, instead of having to pay for a total of 30 licenses for that cluster, I can pay for the 10 and then one and one, and I minimize my license costs. So that, that's just food for thought, and I'll, I'll get into more detail on that and the licensing, and again, in a few more charts. But on the bottom, I was highlighting the fact that with the Enterprise Edition, the goal here is to automate the failover from one side to the other side. So you might be doing the replication synchronously or asynchronously. If you look deeper into it, that async replication is going to be basically set up where you have source and target LUNs, and you have different consistency groups. That consistency group or pooling of the source and target LUNs basically becomes a definition in the cluster configuration. So if you're used to seeing the resources and your resource groups within the cluster, you might have a service IP, volume groups, the application. That consistency group would also be a resource inside of that resource group. Right? So there's a bit of setup that you need to do to get the config in place. But when you do, the way that HA is going to process things, it's going to say if the resource group is being hosted on the top left on uh, LPAR A1, activate everything and start replicating from left to right. If it fails, hey, we know that we may potentially have to come online at the remote side, so prep the volumes and maybe redirect the replication. So the, re the automated redirect depends on whether the operation was induced manually or if it was an unexpected failure and the box went down hard. If it goes down hard, it does not automatically switch the replication. If you just did an RG move operation where you initiated it, it would gracefully stop everything, gracefully activate on the target side, whether you decided to go to B1 or C1. And then if you were in C1, it would redirect the replication. So now you would be replicating from site B over back to uh, site 1. Again, that's what you get if you were to do a configuration with the Enterprise Edition. So we have a number of clients that do their configurations, and they have local clusters, and they may have the replication from site to site, but they don't have the Enterprise Edition. And you don't have to have the Enterprise Edition unless you had the need or the desire to have an automated failover or the ability to have HA provide a mechanism to allow you to move the workload from site one to site two in kind of a pre-canned fashion, right? So I might have the scenario that I had painted on the top of the chart, those uh, LPARs on site B, they don't have to be up and running if they're not part of the cluster. So that's the key difference. If I just have the standard edition, I might have local availability. I may be replicating the data, but I don't have to have active members on the target side because I'm not going to have an automated failover. And that might be a manual process or semi-scripted in my environment. So you might have you know, application level replication like I was showing. Maybe that's Oracle Data Guard doing the replication. Our enterprise edition does not integrate with it. So it doesn't necessarily make sense to have the Enterprise Edition. I might have option two, like I was showing on the bottom, uh, storage level replication. But if it's not integrated with PowerHA and you don't have a desire to do so, you, don't, you have no need for the Enterprise Edition. With the Enterprise Edition, those remote targets would need to be online if you wanted to have some type of automated failover. So they can still be running skinny, like I had showed in the previous chart. So you don't have to consume all the processing power if it's just sitting there as a as an idle standby, but he does have the ability to acquire, there would be heartbeating set up so that those uh, cluster members are listening. And then in the event of a failure or in the event that you wanted to move the workload, you could say, hey, move my resource group from site one over to site two. It would gracefully bring everything up, gracefully bring everything up on the remote site and redirect the replication. Over the last couple of years, we've introduced a number of features with the new split and merge policies, uh, we, we had clients asking for a long time. I like the fact that I might have an automated clustered solution, but what if I want to have a say-so? What if I want user confirmation on failover? And we did not have that in the past. So we had Band-Aids. You could set up, uh, uh, you could comment out the logic in the application start scripts at, on site two, so that in the event that the failover started to take place, 
Maybe it didn't start the application and it waited for you to go ahead and do so. That was kind of a band-aid. You could have left cluster services down on the remote site and then that way, hey, nobody's listening, so nobody's gonna go ahead and activate until you're ready to go ahead and do so. If you took a hit and you wanted to come online on site B, you could start up cluster services and then do a resource group online. So you could have had the cluster configured, but you could have kind of band-aided it to prevent it from going across. With uh, the enhancements, with the new split and merge policies, if you set those policies up to manual, you effectively get user confirmation on failover. So you can set it up to send you prompts via email, and you'd basically get notification, something happened and the cluster is waiting for you to go ahead and take action. And then you can go into the submit panels and say, okay, go ahead and proceed. Or you can do it from the command line. So a simple command, you can say, go ahead and let it go. And then it would go ahead and proceed with the failover. So we've enhanced it from that perspective. And then we, uh, a couple of years ago, had introduced the concept of tiebreaker disks. So you could have had uh, an iSCSI or NAS-based solution where you presented a LUN into the cluster and it could have acted as a tiebreaker disk. And the latest release with HA7.2, you can have an NFS backed space that can act as a tiebreaker space as well. So that's one of the enhancements with the HA7.2 release as far as DR is concerned. So as far as different storage config scenarios, most people are typically uh, used to seeing local cluster setups, single storage subsystem. So both the prod and standby system see the same set of disks. That's, you know, HA101. Um, if I move down the stack, what if I have a second storage subsystem? You know, LPAR1 and LPAR2 um, are sitting in different buildings within the same campus. I do have my SAN stretched. Maybe in building two, I have a second storage subsystem. How can I exploit it? Maybe I can set up logical volume mirroring so each node sees twice as many disks and then the cluster will manage it appropriately. We call that uh, cross-site LVN. So that's one viable option. You could do metro mirroring if you had two storage subsystem and your storage subsystems supported it. So if you were gonna use copy services replication, even though it might be in a synchronous fashion, as soon as you change over from, from uh, logical volume mirroring to either metro or global mirroring, if you want HA to handshake with it, you need the enterprise edition. So for HA to have the handles to be able to acknowledge the fact that that's a replicated target and be able to activate it, you need the enterprise edition. So that, that's the contrast that I wanted to draw there. Now, once you start throwing store-wise devices into the mix, you could have an SBC and then the SVC supports a stretch cluster configuration. So you might have a stretch cluster config at the storage virtualization level, and you might have different storage subsystems behind the scenes, but to your clients, it looks like a single set of volumes, even though you have volume mirroring taking place behind the scenes. So that's kind of cool because it looks like a cross-site LVM configuration where you wind up with two copies on two different storage subsystems, but to the cluster, it looks like a single set of PVIDs and a single set of disks. So that configuration, since you're not using copy services and you're kind of abstracting it from uh, the, the cluster nodes, they're not seeing twice as many disks. They're only seeing a single set of volumes with the same common PVIDs on both sides. For that configuration, you only need the standard edition. You don't need the enterprise edition. So EMC with their VPLEX solution, same type of deal. You, you see the same set of volumes, but you have two copies maintained behind the scenes. With Hitachi, there's a Hitachi ham configuration, same type of deal. You can set it up in that fashion and you only need the standard edition. Uh, I've had a number of clients asking, hey, where's the flash saying that you support it with uh, EMC VPLEX, for example? There's no need for a flash because through the cluster, it just looks like a single set of common disks. There are red papers that have been written by the uh, storage vendors saying, yes, it works with an HA solution, but you don't need an actual flash from us because it just works. It just looks like a common single storage subsystem configuration, even though behind the scenes, there's volume mirroring taking place. So with the SAN volume controller specifically for a number of years, we had what we called a split IO group configuration where you could take the two SVC nodes, stretch them out, effectively separate the pizza pies out, and then you could split your IO group and have different storage subsystems on either side. We have since beefed it up with the enhanced stretch clusters, the higher levels of firmware, where now you don't have to split the IO group. So starting in store Y75, you can set it up as, a, as an enhanced stretch cluster 
They also have a hyper swap configuration. So those configs to the clusters still look like a local cluster configuration, but they come in with a few limitations. So you can have a V7K on the left and a different V7K on the right, but if you want to leverage those configs, we still do not support the hyperswap configuration where they're truly recognized as, as different subsystems. They would be two different IO groups, but within the same cluster. We've had a number of clients asking, hey, can I have transparent hyperswap, which would be two completely separate storage subsystems with some type of replication, but the abstracted view on the client side. That is not quite there today. So you do have viable configurations with hyperswap or, uh, or enhanced stretch clusters, but it still winds up being uh, part of the same cluster, even though they're different IO groups. So that, that's the clarification that I wanted to put with the charts. But either way, if to the cluster it looks like a, the same set of common disks, you only need the standard edition. Uh, Licensing-wise, as soon as we moved up to Power 8, uh, we got rid of the large tier. So on the, our E870 and E880s, now it's only the medium tier, which is nice, I mean, as far as pricing goes. Um, on the bottom, a couple of updates with uh, the enterprise class boxes. We have full integration with Power Enterprise pools. And then now we also do give you the ability to manipulate the shared processor pool size. So one of the options in the integrated DLPAR panels, and I'll show you what it looks like, you can tell it, hey, if I don't have enough space in that shared processor pool and there's additional resource that I can consume, I can have it get expanded on failover as well. So that's kind of nice. So the existing integrated DL park uh, capabilities that we had in prior releases would have allowed us to do a setup like I'm showing, where I set up my LPARs to boot up skinny, and then on start, in the HA application controller definitions, I could have said, I really need additional processing power on whatever node is hosting my workload. So on HA start, my desired count for that application maybe is five. So on start, I would go ahead and SSH out to the HMC automatically, be actively running with what I needed. And then if I ever had to leave that node, those resources would get released back and then they would go ahead and get reacquired on the target side. So same operation, during the activation of the application, it reads those values and it basically ropes them into the cluster. So you're running with what you need. If I were to stop cluster services, cluster wide, everything gets released back and you're right back to where you started as far as your profiles are concerned. So what that lets you do, if you look at, look at it from a licensing perspective, if I anticipate I'm having four different clusters across two systems, so like I'm showing up on the top, maybe I have two clusters that are failing over from left to right, two clusters that are failing from right to left. If my standbys are licensed whole, you know, if I needed five processors for each of those workloads, that's 40 HA licenses, 20 on the left and 20 on the right. I gave you, you know, the roundabout pricing based on the small and medium tiers. We got rid of the large, so I crossed it out, but I still left it in there to reflect the old pricing. Uh, but I could have set up my LPARs to boot up skinny, and I purposely did four clusters because if I show you the bottom scenario, if I stack all my workloads on the left-hand side, just because there are four different clusters doesn't mean that on my standbys I need to have one, 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 and one. I could use micro-partitioning, use 0.25 for my profiles so that when all those LPARs boot up, they add up to one, and then on failover, those guys will get expanded. But again, what that lets me do from a licensing perspective is, hey, I need 20 on the left-hand side because it's hosting my workloads, I only need one on the right-hand side. Again, even though it's four different clusters, I still only need one HA license. I get asked all the time, hey, can't I go skinnier? What if I go 0.1? Go for it. Your boot up times, depending on how much resource you have in those partitions, might take a while, but once you're actively running, it's just listening for heartbeats and it just needs to expand during the acquisition, so it's perfectly fine. Uh, but either way, you need to license a minimum of one if you exceeded the number of uh, Processing units. So if I went to 1.2, I've got to round up to two processors. So it's not always one on the target side. And notice that I made things simple for myself where I took all my workloads and I put them on the left-hand side. If they were distributed from left and right, you know, my roundup numbers might change. So it definitely muddies the water a little bit. But if you're counting your pennies and you're trying to minimize the expense and justify the existence of an HA solution for your critical workloads, I mean, this is one very viable approach where you can cut down your license costs.
and in a DR configuration, it's the same exact scenario. So the scenarios that I painted before when you were loading the Enterprise Edition, I kind of took the same idea and I had System A, System B, and System C. And if I licensed everything whole for you know five processing units, you're talking 60 HA licenses. Uh, if I follow the model on the bottom and I took all my workloads, put them on the left-hand side, I can set up everything skinny on B and C and then get away with 22 HA licenses. So again, I cut down my pricing significantly. So as soon as I bump up to the HA7.2 release, that integrated DL part that we had, it still works you know, effectively the same, but we beefed it up even further and we gave it more capabilities. So as far as uh, Elastic COD, in HA6.1, we only had processor on and off. Uh, we did not have memory. With HA7.2, we brought in the memory, which was nice. And then as far as enterprise pools, with HA7.2, we provided full integration with Power Enterprise pools. Now, I put a note in red um, because that master and backup model with the HMCs, as far as your keys are concerned, changes as soon as you bump up to HMC 885. Uh, the integrated support works all the way up to 884. With 885, it breaks the integration. So that is in the process of being addressed. But until our new release comes out later this year, um, the integration with 885 and the new way that we do the integration with Power Enterprise pools, things will not work as soon as you bump up your HMC level. So be very mindful of that because we had a handful of clients that were starting to deploy this and were counting on Power HA on providing the full automation of the, their mobile activations and enterprise class boxes. And they went ahead and they upgraded their HMCs to 885 and they said, hey, this isn't working anymore. Well, it's in the process of being addressed but it's not as a symbol of a fix because they changed the underlying models. So be, be mindful of that. As far as how the integration worked, I showed the entry points where you define the values that are gonna get expanded on the acquisition of resources, where you define the application controllers in HA. So if you look at the very bottom right of the chart, there's nothing in there saying, go ahead and pull in from the Power Enterprise pool. If you've set up SSH connectivity to your HMCs and you have uh, those uh, cluster members, part of the Power Enterprise pool, HA knows if I need to, I can reach into that bucket. If it's not configured to do so, it will not do so, right? So it, it's not just simply saying reach into the Power Enterprise pool. It's a matter of having enough inactive processors in that box, committing everything that you already had licensed, and then having to reach into that bucket if needed. And I put a video on YouTube. This is a snippet from the video. I mean, as far as uh, the, the way that I configured my environment, I set up my LPARs purposely skinny. So you see my desired counts as far as uh, processors and my virtual processor counts. And then as far as my application went, those are the values that I used. And then the calculation was basically performed during the acquisition where it appended additional values. So the values that I specified for my application controller are not my target count. They're basically the number of resources that were getting appended to my uh, existing LPAR boot up definitions so that I could wind up for uh, or with the processing counts and the virtual processor counts that I actually needed. One of the nice things with the integration with Power Enterprise pools is that you can run a nice seal manager report and at any time, if SSH is configured uh, to handshake with the HMCs, so you effectively have the ROHA integration or the resource optimized uh, high availability, you can run that report with HA services down or HA services up, but it'll tell you as far as your enterprise pools, what's activated and where is it activated, like I'm showing on the bottom right. That's a very small snippet of what that report shows you but it's just kind of handy that at any time, I don't have to bounce back to the HMC to see what's where and that it truly reach into the Power Enterprise pool. Again, as soon as those resources were released, it would do all the cleanup on the HMC without you having to have any type of manual intervention. If you want to see it in more detail, again, take a look at YouTube and you'll see uh, that the video that I put together showing the direct integration with Power Enterprise pools. I show a live demo of me manipulating the resources back and forth and then also how the calculations actually performed. As far as the shared processor pool resize, same type of set up my standby LPARs with minimal processing units, but I could also set up the shared processor pool skinny. So the scenario that I'm showing on the top in the picture, 
I'm running my shared processor pool with six processors and then on the standby side with just one. And then if I had a failover, I could have that shared processor pool get expanded. So the way that I allow this to happen, I can go into the HA screens, change the cluster tunables in the ROHA screens, if you pay attention to the header, and then there's just a simple option that says adjust the shared processor pool if required. If you set that to yes and it needs to expand, it'll go ahead and do so. The nice thing about this particular one is that it's not bound to the enterprise class boxes. So on scale out boxes, if you want to exploit this to minimize the license counts, not only for HA, but also for your middleware, you could potentially exploit this as well. Now there are implications, you know, is Oracle going to go ahead and let you save on this? Uh, that, that's a different story. But, you know, depending on what middleware it is that you're actually using, you can leverage this model to guarantee that the second side is running with the minimal workload at any given time. And that feature is only available with the HA7.2 release as well, by the way. Uh, as far as deploy methods, uh, you still have the spit panels. You've got enhancement for the command line interface, which I'll show on the next screen. And then, you know, you still have the initial path with it, where it does the discovery and lets you do the setup. Or you can do, go into the custom cluster configuration where you, you get to pick the names instead of letting it discover things for you. I typically go into the custom config where I do it via command line. One of the nice enhancements that came in, though, a little while back, was the ability to take an existing cluster config, and if you took a snapshot, you could use it as a template to deploy additional clusters. So if you know that you're gonna be deploying multiple clusters, you can take the snapshot from cluster one, install the additional cluster members that are gonna be separate clusters, and leverage that snapshot, and I show you the syntax, I do a seal manager, uh, manage snapshot restore, specify that snapshot name, and what it'll let you do is during the apply of that snapshot, it'll basically allow you to change the names of the nodes and the service IP labels. So it lets you effectively clone the config, but create a new cluster definition. So again, another potential expedited way to deploy your clusters if you're gonna do a bunch of the same. Uh, the command line interface, as soon as you bump up to any of the version seven releases, was enhanced significantly from prior releases. I put together some uh, rapid deploy cluster worksheets. I kind of think of them as a cheat sheet if you wanted to do a very fast deploy and not even go into the SMIT panels. So if you install the code, you have your resources already shared, and you just want to create the cluster shell and get up and going, you know, five commands, and you can be up and going. I think it's page seven inside of that document. Uh, it's just a one pager that shows you, hey, how do I get up and running really quick? Uh, obviously, the document's a little bit longer. It's got some other usability commands in it. Uh, but just page seven gives you that nice little cheat sheet to get, go ahead and get up and going quickly. Other enhancements available within the product, if you had an application deployed um, and it happened to be one of the applications that we have smart assist packages for, I get asked about this a lot again, um, you know, what do the smart assist provide? If you install the file sets for the smart assist, it'll again provide additional SMIT panels within the HA menus. So Again, I'm showing screenshots on the bottom of the chart where you can go into the uh, Smart Assist portion and let's say it was SAP, for example, select this uh, SAP Smart Assist entry point and then at the bottom you see that it can do an automatic discovery and detect the fact that the application is already installed and create the cluster shell based on the values that it actually detects. The Smart Assist gives you an expedited way to deploy the cluster shell where it'll create the cluster name, the node names, uh, the resource group, It'll provide application start and stop logic, and it'll provide application monitors as well from the get-go. So if the config that it leaves you with is good enough for what you need, it's a nice, quick, expedited way to get up and going. If you were playing with an older release, let's say you had HA6.1, which did not have the SAP Smart Assist, for example, I've had clients say, well, I really need to be on version seven because version seven is the one that has the SAP Smart Assist. We had thousands of clients deploying SAP with HA6.1 without the Smart Assist. So it's a nice to have, but it is not required. It does not leave you with running agents or anything special. It's a configuration wizard, effectively. So we have a number of different available Smart Assist. I highlighted a couple of them uh, on the chart, but it, it's just a nice to have. Do you have to use it? No, not at all. You can use it to get the base build, and then if you wanted to enhance the cluster config, you could go ahead and proceed and append additional resources or make changes to it. So it's just a nice way to get up and going quickly. So as far as you know, planning for your clusters, obviously you got a number of different network aspects. I'll dive deeper as I go through the charts. 
Um, I highlighted the fact that the early v7 releases required you to have IP multicasting enabled. If you deploy uh, either the HA7.2 or 7.1.3 releases, you don't have to worry about the multicast. We will unicast by default, and if you wanted to use IP multicasting, you could. So you're no longer re multicasting. As far as the cluster config, I mean, as long as you have the prereqs in place and you have the, the proper OS levels that you need to install, and I highlighted those early on in the presentation, um, you can go ahead and install the HA code and then worry about the config. And then as far as the storage is concerned, I highlighted the fact that we support anything that's supported by AIX in a local cluster setup. Um, some of the changes, when you bump up to uh, a version seven cluster and we rely on that cluster aware AIX infrastructure, you now need what we call a repository disk. So cluster aware AIX during the cluster setup is gonna ask you, what is your repository disk? You need to have a common shared disk between all of the cluster members. Now, in an enterprise configuration where you're going site to site, that's a little different, right? You're maybe gonna need two, one for site one and one for site two. And I, again, I'll cover that a little bit further as I go through the, the rest of the presentation. But that's the main difference from prior releases as far as the cluster configuration and topology. Um, so that's the key thing I wanted to highlight there. As far as your resources, how they're gonna get acquired, what type of policies or behaviors are they gonna follow? We still have the concept of a startup, failover, and fallback policy. The ones highlighted in purple are the default policies, but you can certainly change those guys. And then think of our resource group as a container. Based on where that resource group is being hosted, those resources are gonna basically follow the policies and get those highly available resources online. If you wanna get fancy, or if you had different uh, highly available resources that are independent of each other, or maybe one set needs to come online first and then another set, you can have uh, resource group dependencies where you say, bring this workload online first, followed by this additional workload. So you can get you know, a little bit more granular as far as the level of control. You can set up parent-child dependencies where you say, if that first workload goes away, take that child workload away as well, because it doesn't make sense for it to stay there. And then whenever I restart the parent resource group, then go ahead and follow with the child resource group wherever it gets restarted. If it's a failover, it'll do it automatically. Um, so we've had for years those parent and child resource group dependencies. Uh, we've had the concept of location dependencies where you can set up priorities. You can say my production stuff has a high priority and maybe on the standby side, I have a resource group that only has the standby node in it. So all it does is automate the start and stop of the application or the test and dev workload but because it only has a single node inside of that resource group, it'll never fail over. It just simply, HA is only controlling the start and stop of that workload. What, you might ask, well, what's the benefit of doing that? If I set a low priority for that dev resource group, and I have a high priority for my production workload that maybe is running on another node, if I have, ever have a failover, the low priority and the high priority resource groups cannot coexist on the same box. So it would automatically invoke the stop scripts for that dev workload, bring it offline, and then allow the production stuff to go ahead and uh, take its place effectively. So a nice way to potentially destage that test and dev environment and then allow the production stuff to come online. Um, if you don't want to have the type of uh, grouping that a parent-child dependency brings into the mix, we provided a little bit more flexibility in the later releases. We now allow you to have a start after and a stop after so again, if the first resource group that comes online goes away, maybe you don't want the second one to go away. You want it to stay. So maybe set up a start after type of dependency and that way you don't have the parent child type of allocations. What most people are typically used to is seeing the static failover policy. They define a resource group and they say, start up on node A, then go to node B and then node C. Now we can get fancier than that um, we've had the concept of dynamic node priority for a lot of years. Notice that I have three boxes up on top. Now, in a two-node cluster, probably doesn't make a lot of sense to have a dynamic node priority because you only have one viable failover target. But if I have three or more failover targets, maybe I don't just want to fail over to B, maybe I want to go to the node with the least processor utilization or the least memory utilization, right? So I could potentially define a dynamic node priority based on those values. Now, we've had clients that said, well, maybe I don't wanna go based on those criteria. 
maybe I want to plug in my own logic to say, instead of failing over to node C or node B, check, run my logic, and then based on my logic, go to this particular node. So we introduced the concept of this dynamic adaptive failover where you can plug in your own user-defined scripts and based on the return codes, the node would go ahead and move that resource group to whatever the appropriate target was. So it doesn't necessarily have to go A, B, and C. It can do that adaptive failover or follow the dynamic node priority settings. Again, more of a, an advanced type feature that's been around for a little while, but some clients are not aware that this is even there. Application monitoring, uh, for many years we've had the framework within the cluster where we can say, we'll start and stop your application, but what if the application goes away? What do you want us to do? By default, we do nothing. If the Yelp is still there and he's able to heartbeat, we don't trigger any events. If you opted to exploit the application monitors, now you can either have the cluster send you emails and notify you, you can have the cluster try to do restarts, you can have the cluster initiate an actual takeover. So if you use the smart assist to do the deploy, we provide application monitors from the get-go. So they would already be there. If you manually are defining the cluster config, you have the option to define a startup, a process, or a custom monitor. For the, the startup is a one-time run during the activation. And for a while, we used to recommend, hey, if you care that whenever you invoke the startup cluster services and the application doesn't come online, if you want the cluster to do something beyond, you know, just simply saying, I ran it, that's it. Maybe it started, maybe it didn't. We used to recommend defining a startup monitor. So the way that it's worked for many years is we take a look at the application start script, we invoke it, we don't care if it comes back clean. We just say, hey, run it in the background, and we're done. Um, if you want the cluster to get hung up or try to do a retry, then maybe it makes sense to have a startup monitor. A few releases back, they introduced this new application startup mode. So in the 711 release, again, a lot of clients, this feature just kind of went under the radar. So what you can do with that particular feature is, by default, we run in the background, but if you change the application startup mode to run in the foreground, if your application startup comes back unclean, it'll hang up the cluster processing. So you'll basically never see the cluster get into a stable state and you'll know that you go, need to go ahead and take action. That's a potential configuration setting that you, know, you might evaluate, but know that the default behavior is to invoke it in the background. So if it came back with a non-zero return code, we don't care. We, we invoked it and it's, it's kind of lingering out there. Now, if you don't have application monitoring, we'll never try to reacquire it elsewhere unless you configured something else to come in and do a check, right? You might be getting phone calls from your users saying, hey, I can't access the application, something's not there, um, and that, that would be your trigger. But if you want something automated to take place, either exploit the different type of monitors or consider deploying you know, this foreground option in your startup mode. If you look internally as far as the cluster configs, we changed the protocols that we use with version 7 clusters. I mentioned that the current stable points, 713 and HA72, will use unicast by default. Um, starting in version 7 clusters, we introduced the ability to heartbeat across your HBAs. So, so with the 4 gig and 8 gig fiber channel cards, uh, you can set them up with target mode, zone them in together, and cluster where AX will exploit them for heartbeating. We're kind of phasing away from that feature, so I purposely put it in red. The copy that you guys may get, it may still be blue, uh, but it still works. But for example, the 16 gig cards don't support target mode. Uh, going forward, we may no longer continue to support that feature. So if it's part of your cluster designs today, you can leave it as is, but I've been telling, telling a lot of clients that are doing new deploys, you might consider just skipping because we're potentially not going to go ahead and continue the exploitation of that HBA-based market. And I have a separate chart later on in the presentation that kind of shows you why some, some clients were reluctant to actually use that feature. It's easy if you're using dedicated adapters because you, you just have to zone in the initiators. Uh, but in a virtualized configuration, because of the zoning requirements, we had a number of clients saying, eh, I'll probably never use that. So we, we've kind of laid off of that particular feature. And then the repository disk that I mentioned in a local cluster setup, this is part of the cluster config. It's going to ask you what disk is it and not let you proceed until you define one and sync up the cluster. It's automatically used for heartbeating. So the application monitoring I mentioned is optional. And then there's a number of enhancements that have been released as far as making the environment more resilient. The next set of charts, I'll cover some of those guys in a little more detail. 
uh, but just kind of wanted to give you a point of reference as to what a cluster would look like and the fact that we're kind of phasing away from the HPA-based heart beating. So most clients are probably used to see in standard cluster configs. So those split and merge policies that I mentioned earlier, not supported. If you put site definitions into your cluster config, now again, this is regardless of if you're using the standard edition or the enterprise edition of the product. If you're using a local cluster config and you put site definitions, you have now the ability to define a stretched or linked cluster. Stretched clusters support those tiebreaker disk functions. Linked clusters support not only the tiebreaker disks, but the split and merge policies that allow you to use that manual setting. So the topology that you pick actually does kind of matter, right? We had a number of uh, lab service guys do some deploys, and they were like 20 clusters in, and they said, hey, the client would really like to use the manual failover option in their local cluster setups, but we're not seeing it. So, you know, they, they reached out to me and I was like, well, it needs to be set up as a linked cluster for you to see those options. And they were like, well, how do I convert from standard to linked? Uh, the only option is to destroy the cluster. So simple in the big scheme of things, if all the resources are already shared, but you've got to recreate the cluster. Now, they had to recreate 20 clusters to be able to go ahead and reconfigure them as linked. So it's not a dynamic change to go from one to the next. So you want to plan this out, you know, and see which one actually makes sense. Um, the differences between a standard and a, and a stretch cluster, not very many. You're still playing with the same set of, you know, shared disks. Just stretched allows you to put site definitions so that you can use things like site-specific IPs, site-specific resource group dependencies, maybe use tiebreaker disks. If you're doing a setup where maybe you're doing cross-site LVM across a campus, you probably want to define it as a stretch and put the site definitions. You may not have site-specific IPs, but it probably makes more sense to define it as a stretch because there's extra features that you can exploit. And then starting in the HA7.2 release, that repository disk, now they let you have up to six backup repository disks. If you're playing with the higher levels of AIX and you have a failure of the repository disk, it automatically swaps. Now that only happens with AIX 7.1 TL4 and AIX 7.2. And you, obviously you've got to be playing with the latest release of HA, HA 7.2. That's a nice to have. So if the repository disk fails and you have a backup predefined or pre-allocated, it'll auto swap. So it's nice. You can still dynamically do it if it's not set up as a backup. You can go to your SAN guy, provision a new LUN, and then it's a dynamic operation to get rid of the old one and use the new one. The fact that it's automatic, it's nice, it's okay. It's not an incentive to bump up to the very latest release or to have six backups in place. I was having the same discussion with a client yesterday where uh, they were asking, well, how many should I have? And I said, what's the likelihood that you're going to lose access to just one LUN in your environment, still have access to your data volumes, but just one LUN is going to get locked if they're coming from the same exact uh, SAN back storage subsystem? Very, very unlikely that you would lose access to one LUN. That's why I say it, it's, it's a nice feature as far as the auto-swapping, but it's not a critical feature. So here I'm showing during the initial cluster config when you go into the SMIT panels, if I put site definitions, and you'll see in the top left I have a site A, and uh, I have the option to define it as stretched. Stretched allows me to pick a single repository disk, and if I put site definitions like I'm showing on the right-hand side, and I pick a linked cluster, it's going to say site 1 has, is going to have its own repository disk, and site two is going to have its own repository disk. So that's the biggest contract, contrast going from one to the next. So if you want a visual cue, very next chart, I've got site definitions, site A and site B on the top cluster, single repository disk. On the bottom, the linked cluster topology, I'm showing two nodes on the left, one node on the right. Each site has its own repository disk. I painted it like most people typically would associate this with an enterprise edition configuration. It does not have to be an enterprise edition config, and it does not have to have two nodes on the left and one node on the right. It doesn't matter. You could have one and one. The topology that you pick is basically going to dictate how many repository disks you need. Most people typically would associate a linked topology with an enterprise edition cluster, but that does not mean that you cannot use it in a standard edition configuration. So if you have multiple storage subsystems, the questions that have come up are, where does my repository disk come from? Does it come from the subsystem on the left? Do I define another one and set up a link cluster? So he comes from the second storage subsystem. If I define backups, right, do they come from the left, the right? Do I crisscross them? How many should I have? 
HA7-2 allows you to define up to six backups. If it's going to be painful for you to get your storage guy to give you a new LUN on the fly, maybe pre-provision at least one additional backup repository disk so that if you ever had a failure and it auto swaps, then you're good to go. You don't have to worry about it. Again, what's the likelihood that you're going to lose access to just one LUN and not lose access to all of your data volumes in addition to it so that HA triggers a failover? Very unlikely. So, I mean, as far as, far as your cluster design goes, you kind of have to pick and choose what makes sense for your environment. What's the most likely scenario? In my environments, um, I showed you the output of an LSPB up on top. I have my active repository disk and I have two backups. I only have a single storage subsystem, so I only defined it like that because I could just to play around with it and experiment. I tend to make my repository disks one gig LUNs like you see in the second output, and then the additional ones, they're just tests, so they're only 10 gig volumes that I'm playing with. The minimum size for your repository disk is 512 meg. Anything beyond that, it's wasted space. So if your standard LUN size is 30 gigs and you just want to go ahead and allocate 30 gig LUNs, go for it. Just know that we're not using anything beyond those 512 meg. And then the other painful piece that I've had is, if you look at the top of the output and the LSPV, there's no way for me to differentiate those LUNs. I just see that they have H disks and PVIDs. There's no VG, no nothing. In the HA ODM, um, it does know, hey, this is my active, and you know, Mike went in and defined these guys as backups. There's cluster commands, like I'm shown on the bottom, that will show you which ones uh, the repository disks are. If you explicitly run the, the command on the very bottom, it tells you which one the active, active one is and which ones are the backups. So that's okay, but if you're not a cluster guy, you may not know, you know to go ahead and uh, run those commands. So one of the things that they've recommended in the latest red books, you know, and in the documentation, maybe run a rendev and rename those devices. So instead of leaving them as H disks, maybe you call it a CAA rep zero, CAA rep one, CAA rep two. And that way somebody says, oh, that must be something important. It's not just a regular H disk. Never mind the fact that it's a tiny disk, so maybe I want to, it doesn't give me the space that I need but I, I, maybe I should rename it so that way somebody doesn't come in and try to snag it and, and see it as a free volume. Definitely be mindful. If you had something like PowerPath or HDLM and now you, know, you rename a device and it's expecting an HDS power device, you're going to cause yourself additional headaches. But you know, if, if you're just playing with H disks in your environment, maybe renaming those devices actually makes sense. Um, another scenario that we've had you know, from clients is what if I can't have any shared storage subsystem? Right, so I've got um, scale-out boxes. They only have internal drives. Now, Mike just finished telling me that I need to have a shared repository disk for a local cluster configuration. How the heck do I get a shared disk if I only have internals? So, in my scenario, I took just a small box, and I only have internal disks. So maybe I can come in and set up a linked cluster topology, which lets me have a maximum of two sites. I put site definitions, so site one's on the left, site two is on the right. And now my repository disk can be an internal. Now I can only have a maximum of two members in my cluster, one on site one and one on site two. And now you're probably wondering, well, how do I keep the data in sync? You could come in and do a GLVM or geographic logical volume mirroring configuration. And then the updates will take place over the network connection. So if I use synchronous GLVM, even though these guys might be next to each other, you will effectively wind up with what I'm showing on the bottom right of the screen where you'll have, you know, half, uh, local disks, and then the second set of disks you would see as long as the IP link was active. So you would wind up with, instead of three disks, you would wind up with six disks in your volume group. Uh, if you did an LS dev, the second set of disks would show up as RPVs or remote physical volumes. Set up the logical volume mirroring. You would need to use the enterprise edition because it's the only one that will automate that GLVM replication. And then set up your cluster with the enterprise edition to fail over from box one to box two and not have to have a shared disk for your cluster aware AIX requirement. So it's a potential workaround if you have boxes and you don't have some type of shared storage subsystem in your environment. Um, another question that's come up is that repository disk. If it's part of the cluster configuration, as soon as I stop cluster services, what if I needed to update my multipath driver? That device still stays open. So what, what can I do? Uh, in the 713 release, Service Pack 1, they added those flags that I'm showing on the bottom. So if you stop cluster services and specify the stop CAA option, it'll delete the repository disk, 
and then on start, as soon as you uh, specify the start CAA equals yes, it'll recreate the repository disk contents and the volume group that are on there. But what that lets you do is that lets you free up the volume so that you can update your multipath driver, and then upon restart of cluster services, it'll rebuild everything as it was before. In my example, I'm stopping cluster services cluster-wide. You could do this, the stop and start on one node at a time, and it'll clean up the repository disk from the left side, and then upon restart of that node, it'll go ahead and rebuild the repository disk view. So you do not have to do just the option that I'm showing. You can do it on one node at a time instead of going cluster-wide. I have tested it in the lab. Uh, Network-wise, historically, we said if you have you know, physical adapters, we recommend having two in your HA networks. You're going to have maybe your base IP addresses, and then you're going to have the floating service and the concept of maybe persistent IP so that you can get to that box with a routable IP. Uh, the reason that we did this is because before we relied on RSCT topology services to set up a heartbeat rings so that if I had a problem with my heartbeat ring on top, HA knew that he could do a local adapter swap, or if he had a problem with both of the rings, he knew that he could go ahead and relocate the service IP to the other side. As our product has evolved and we kind of have beefed up with different scenarios, we had clients move to this type of model where they maybe had uh, ether channels in place or link aggregation, and then if they had a free card, maybe they said, let's go ahead and throw a crossover cable and then that way we have another HA network and I have heartbeating going across, bypassing the network switches. And then as we've evolved even further, they kind of got rid of that crossover cable and they said, you know what, my deployment's virtualized. Um, so I've already got a virtual adapter that's redundant behind the scenes. I don't want to have any dedicated adapters because maybe I'm going to be doing live partition mobility. So let's simplify my topology. So I could go with model uh, C on the very bottom using link aggregation or a virtualized adapter. And it might look something like this in a virtualized setup. I only present a single virtual adapter with a base IP address and a floating service or a set of service IPs under the covers at my VIO server level. I might have redundancy and link aggregation there, but it's completely abstracted from the HA nodes. Now, if you pay attention, the IPs that I use, my base address and my service IP address, they're on the same subnet. That is viable if I only have a single adapter on the left and a single adapter on the right. If I threw in an EN1 as part of that network on the left-hand side and an EN1 on the right-hand side, my HA verification would say that is not a valid config. So be mindful of that. Um, you know, if you're going across physical footprints, it would probably look something like this, where you have dual VIOs on the left, dual VIOs on the right. For a long time, I showed this with SEA failover. It does not have to be SEA failover. It had a uh, virtual Ethernet with uh, virtual switches in place and you wanted to use link aggregation there with a network interface backup setup, perfectly viable as well. Uh, the red books give you some recommendations, so just be mindful that it does not have to be SEA failover. And then this is the scenario that I mentioned. If I had multiple adapters like I'm showing on the bottom with an EN0 and an EN1, I have to have private IPs and they cannot be on the same subnet as my service IP. So you would say, if HA services are down, how do I get to that box? In that bottom example, it would probably make sense to have persistent IP addresses. So that way, if HA services were down, that persistent IP could be on the same subnet as the service, and I could connect to it. And that would be my administrative IP. And then the service IP would be what the client connect to and floats back and forth based on where the workload is. If I wanted to distribute them into two different networks, like I'm showing up on top, then I can have the base address and the service IP be on the same subnets. So again, I still have two adapters in the mix. I maybe have different service IPs, but in order for my base adapter and my service IP to be on the same subnets, they have to be in the type of config like I'm showing on the very top of the chart. All right, so we kind of simplify things with version seven, where my topology might be super simple. I have node one, node two. I have you know, a single boot on the left, single boot on the right, and then the service IP address shows up twice because that's my floating address, the 239 IP. And then notice that if I just simply displayed my cluster topology with one of the legacy commands, I only had E and zero showing up as, far, as part of my topology. But under the covers with cluster aware AIX, it's not just using E and zero, it's also using any other adapter that's defined on that box. On my environment, I happen to have an, an E and one as well. Cluster aware AIX is trying to communicate out of that E and one as well. If I had 10 NICs, 
and the additional nine were not part of the cluster network or config, CAA would still try to use them. If you wanted to restrict CAA, you can. Uh, you can create a private network, and that would restrict the communication out of that adapter. But by default, cluster where AIX tries to talk out of anything that it can. The SFW or storage framework communication, it's the HPA-based heart beating if, you, if you've enabled it. Um, remember that I said that that feature is kind of going away, so you more than likely we'll kind of be phasing that out. And then the repository disk shows up at the, at the bottom as dpcom. So again, the bottom ones are kind of handled automatically. My HA topology is super simple, and Cluster Aware AIS will try to use anything and everything that it can by default. So one of the things that's come up also is the heartbeat rate. Um, we changed it when we bumped up to version 7. So by default, with Cluster Aware AIX in place, if you had a loss of communication for anything longer than five seconds, it starts to say, let's do something, which is a really tight window. So we had a lot of clients saying, hey, in your older releases, you went a lot slower. It was like anywhere between you know, uh, 24 to 30 seconds. How the heck do I do that? In early V7 releases, those five seconds were not tunable. So that uh, value that I just loaded on the bottom left, the quick failure detection process is the default, and it's not tunable up until you get to the latest releases. So with HA7.2, you get the SMIT panels like I'm showing, where it'll now automatically revert back to something along the lines of 30 seconds, and you can make it slower if you wanted to. But early V7, five seconds, really tight window. So if you're playing with 7.1.3, you still are playing with the quick failure detection process. Again, those five seconds are really tight. So one of the things that you can do, you can call our support guys and say, Hey, you guys have some new functionality that lets you tune the failure detection rate. So I'm playing with 713. I haven't moved up to AJ72. I want to be able to throttle back that failure detection rate from five seconds to something longer. If you request that tunable failure detection rate fix bundle, you'll have the ability to tune it. It does not give you the SMIT panels, but you can tweak it via command line, and the instructions in the readme are super useful. So it's pretty simple, but up until you get to the very latest release, we have not throttled back the failure detection rate or give you the ability to tune it like you could in earlier releases. So I, I wanted to highlight that piece since it's, kind of, again, one of those things that kind of falls under the radar, and unless you read the pubs, you may not pick up on it. Also, the configuration of the Netmon C fi uh, CF file has transitioned as being part of RSCT. With the latest release, we handed off that functionality to Clusterware AIX. In the big scheme of things, that's semantics, but what some of our support reps tried to do for a while, they said, you know, if you have a single adapter network, we've always recommended that you configure a Netmon CF file, and we used to recommend that we plugged in at least one IP address outside of the cluster, so that if you had some type of, you know, communication problem, the cluster would use the Netmon logic to try to ping something outside of the cluster to determine, hey, is the problem local? Is the problem lo uh, global? Do I need to move the resources? Do I need to stay? What do I do? So the entries that I'm showing up on top is typically what we defined, at least maybe the default gateway or something outside of the box. Some of the support reps for a while were saying, well, if you want to throttle back the failure detection rate, maybe put the same entries over and over and loop them in the uh, Netmon CF file, like I'm showing on the rest of the bottom of the Netmon CF example. That does not work. That only adds about half a second. So if somebody recommended that somewhere along the line, don't do that. Nix the bottom part and just leave the top. If you want to tune your failure detection rate, get that iFix bundle or play with the latest release of HA that gives you the menus and will automatically do 30 seconds instead of the five seconds. Um, other settings that you may or may not have heard about, if you're virtualized, if you have the physical ad adapters owned by the VIO server, and like I'm showing on the bottom of the chart in red, if your physical link goes down, but you've got a, a an LPAR that's relying, so a virtualized LPAR that's relying on that VIO server, just because the physical link went down doesn't make the virtual link go down, right? So he can still talk to the VIO server. If you enable this pull uplink setting, the physical link, if it goes down, it'll make that virtual link go down and then it'll cause HA to react effectively. If you don't know about that pull uplink setting, you know, there was not a lot of documentation out there to make you aware of it. The requirements are VIO223.4 or later, and then uh, 
There's some enhancements in the EMT stat output in AX71 PL3. Uh, the way that you enable it, I gave you the syntax here. So you can enable pull uplink. I show you the possible settings. And then you do it at the client level. So again, you see the attributes on the very bottom with pull uplink. Um, in the EMT stat output, if you have it enabled, if you uh, had a failure, you can see the output on the right-hand side in blue. What would show up? If you don't have those AIX levels, you would not see the enhanced output in the EMT stat output. But again, be aware that if you're virtualizing your environments, you probably want to go ahead and enable that pull uplink attribute. This one's showing for the HBA-based heart beating. Um, the requirement, if you're doing import ID virtualization, you might have physical worldwide port numbers, but the virtual worldwide port numbers up on top on the client level are the ones that you would typically zone in to see your disks. For the heartbeat traffic to pass over the HBAs, we basically told clients, you need to zone in the physical ports to create a bridge across BIO servers and different footprints um, in order for cluster aware AIX to exploit the heartbeating across HBAs. And we had a number of clients saying, I would never zone that. Um, that goes against our zoning practices. So again, that's kind of why we're not continuing to support the HBA-based heartbeating going forward. You will probably not be seeing uh, the 16 gig or anything faster get TME support or target mode support in order to enable cluster aware AX to heartbeat across your HBAs. Again, if it's part of your existing cluster designs, you'll be able to disable it going forward. You can use it for time being, but as you get the faster cards or if you buy new boxes and they come in with 16 gig cards, we will not support that HBA-based heartbeating. Um, there were also some restrictions. If you were going to do things like live partition mobility, if you were LPMing node one from frame one to frame two, and the VIO servers on the target side were already primed, they had the requirements with the uh, VLAN 3350A, they had that target mode setting set, LPM would work. But if you were LPMing to a vanilla frame that did not have those settings in place, it would prevent you from doing the LPM. So again, that was, you know, some of the statements that we made in the Red Book saying, hey, be mindful that if you're going to do HBA-based heartbeat communication, LPM may not work. So you could manually disable things so that you could perform the LPM, but just be mindful that there were some restrictions there. Going forward, since we will probably not be supporting HBA-based heartbeating anymore, this will all go away anyway. As far as LPM is concerned, I mentioned, you know, we have many, many clients that are doing live partition mobility with uh, PowerHA. Typically, you have to do nothing. But if you want to be cautious, you can consider unmanaging the PowerHA resources. You can disable the SAN-based communication. And then there's a number of things that you can do. You can throttle back your failure detection rate, assuming you've got the proper levels. Um, you can disable the HAGs or the group services monitoring. And then you can stop the DMS timer, initiate the LPM, let it complete, and re-enable those settings. The nice thing is HA72 does all those things automatically. The unmanage of the resources is optional. You should not have to unmanage your resources to do an LPM operation. It's a control knob with HA72. If you want to get a warm and fuzzy that HA will not trigger failover for whatever reason, you can unmanage LPM and then remanage. Just be mindful that when you remanage resources in HA, and this is completely uh, regardless of whether you're doing live partition mobility or not, it re-invokes the application start script. So if your start script has already been run and you unmanage and then remanage the resources, it'll try to re-invoke the application start scripts. So knowing about it, if, if, you, if you care or if it matters in your environment, you can comment out the application startup logic and then remove that comment after you've uh, remanaged the resources. But the key thing is HA72 does all these things automatically. Remember early on I told you that uh, the cluster manager has a level of awareness of live partition mobility with 713 and earlier. These are the recommendations that you'll find in Knowledge Center. So if you want to do it manually, feel free to go ahead and do it uh, to get a warm and fuzzy. This is probably the most reliable way to get LPM to complete and not trigger a failover. We've had many clients do it without having to disable these things. But I would probably recommend doing the stuff that's darker, the stuff in the grayish color, complete the option. Um, root VG failure handling, if you boot it up off the SAN, the latest release with the proper AIX levels that I'm showing in the bottom right will mark your root VGs as critical automatically, meaning that if you had some type of IO failure or if you disconnected the fiber channel connections before, 
we had a demon in HA doing the checking. We still have that demon, but they did enhancements from the LVM side. So HA72 marks your root BGs as critical if they're not set as critical, so it's kind of handled under the covers. If you're not playing with those AIX levels and you don't have HA72 and you want to exploit that LVM set of enhancements, you can manually make your root BG a critical BG with the commands on the bottom. So with HA713, you can make your root BGs critical BGs, so that way if there's some type of LVM uh, I.O. failure to your root BGs, it'll go ahead and trigger a failover faster. So some enhancements there. And then there were some new quarantine policies introduced where, again, if heart beating was locked across all the links, you can exploit the HMC as a last line of defense. You can exploit your storage subsystems where they'll fence out the source. This is completely optional as far as the quarantine features. This could become part of your cluster design. So if you care, if heart beating ceases across all the links, you want to make sure that uh, a workload doesn't come across to the other side unless we're 100% certain that the source got nuked. You can use these new quarantine features with the AG72 release to ensure that that critical resource group does not come online unless the source is truly gone. So again, HA72 gives you a little bit more flexibility there. Um, configuring it pretty straightforward. You go into the split merge policies, quarantine policy. For the HMC one, you've got to have SSH connectivity to the HMC. Then for the uh, fencing one, you've got to have uh, persistent reserve support for uh, uh, your storage subsystem. So if it supports it, you can go ahead and exploit it, and it's automatically set on the client side after you enable that fencing feature and set it to yes. Uh, WPARS, with the transition of 5.3 being natively supported on Power 8, um, the support I think only carries over until 2017. We've had a number of clients moving on to Power 8. We fully support version WPARS with Power HA we treat them as resource groups. So your resource group name would have to have the same name as your WPAR. Lately, I've had a handful of clients saying, that's what I want to do because the support for version WPAR control is longer than the native AIX 5.3 support on Power 8. So I just wanted to highlight the fact that we can manage WPARs within a Power HA construct. You're not running Power HA inside of the WPAR anymore or inside of that AIX 5.3 image. You would be running it in the global area and we can start and stop your WPARs if needed. So again, could be a potential consideration going forward in your environments, but I've seen a handful of these come up lately and I wanted to just throw in a chart in there for your reference. And then the last couple uh, charts that I had were pertaining to uh, a remote restart. We've had a number of other clients saying, hey, I heard of this cool stuff that comes in with Power 8, simplified remote restart, where if I've got the Power VM Enterprise Edition, maybe I don't need to have a cluster. So I kind of wanted to paint the picture and show you what it provides and where it may or may not make sense in the sense that a cluster configuration for your critical individual workloads might still make sense. So not to paint a bad picture on the simplified remote restart, but it's got, a, it's, got its place, I guess. So the key thing here is if you make your LPARs in a virtualized fashion, and you've got power rate boxes, you can exploit the simplified remote restart. So notice that I've got a couple of LPARs on the bottom that have the checkboxes that are SRR capable. Everything's fully virtualized. In order for the simplified remote restart to work, the entire physical frame actually has to go down. So if it does go down, you would now have the capability to perform a manual remote restart operation for each of those individual LPARs. So it is not an automated flip of those LPARs. So I can SRR, uh, that particular one across to a different frame, kind of like an LPM, but your VIO servers are not available. So again, it assumes that everything's virtualized. You've got Power VM, Enterprise Edition, you've got the zoning in place to be able to go ahead and perform the SRR operation. And obviously you've got to have the space and the capacity available on those target machines that you're going to go to. Um, so again, entire frame goes down. If I contrast it to a clustering solution, if I had a failure of an individual LPAR um, and I try to remote restart it somewhere else, that does not work. So one of my counterparts in my team was doing some testing and the very first question that I had when he was saying, hey, this might get rid of clustering as a whole to simplify things. And I said, ah, okay, let's see it. So I said, what if I have this scenario? What if I have a bunch of LPARs on my box, but the entire footprint doesn't go down? Just a single LPAR has a failure. I said, show me what happens when I try to do the remote restart operation. So we did. So LPAR, we simulated bringing it down, and then I did an RR uh, start LPAR operation to the target machine, and I got a failure. 
it said that's not a valid state to support the remote restart. So what would you do in this scenario? If just simply your critical workload goes down, what are you going to do? You're going to recreate the LPAR? You're going to restore from MAXSB, right? You, you could cluster it, uh, but you, now you've got to troubleshoot, right? You're, you're in recovery mode to try to figure out what happened. You do not have another viable target. So clustering still makes sense for certain workloads. Just kind of wanted to, you know, paint a picture. When in the top example I had the failure, I could not perform an RR or a remote restart operation for that particular machine or an active life partition mobility. But if I did have a cluster configured in place, again, maybe not for everything, for, but for your critical workloads, if my LPAR on the bottom left uh, were to take a hit, the failover would take place. You've got a completely independent uh, operating system running that's waiting and ready to go and acquire that workload. So just wanted to contrast the two solutions real quick. Um, I'll be doing a different, more detailed pitch over at Edge on simplified remote restart. It does have its benefits. So we're doing a bunch of testing in our labs. I'll highlight that in, in follow-up sessions, but just wanted to contrast the solutions. In summary, I covered a number of different things. You know, I talked about sites, stretch clusters, link clusters. Hopefully you got, you know, some useful information there. I tried to highlight some of the differences with the HA7.2 release, uh, Power Enterprise tools, how we have integration there, but with the 885 HMC code, we break that integration. That will be getting addressed later this year. And then, you know, I highlighted a number of design considerations as I went throughout the pitch. Beyond that, uh, there's a new red book that came out earlier in the year based on HA7.2. If you're not aware, I gave you the links. There's a LinkedIn group, and I'm not a huge LinkedIn guy, but that group is nice because anytime we come out with new videos or new contents, you get a nice notification telling you, hey, check this out. So you can request to become a member of the group. You get some nice useful information if you're a PowerHA user, if you're looking into it. And then if you have simple questions, I mean, uh, and you don't want to call support, there's a nice forum out there where you can submit your questions. We have a number of IBMers that contribute there. Uh, the product stable points and the publications. Let me stop there. I know it was a lot of content. And uh, Joe, I don't know if you were going at it, you know, answering questions or if there's a number of things that backed up. Um, that's all I had, guys. I appreciate your time. And Joe, if you tell me uh, if there's anything you want to read off to me or... Okay, so um, a couple of things. One, there are a bunch of questions that are backed up, um, Mike, so maybe see if we can go through a couple of those. Um, since you just talked about simplified remote restart, I will say that that is our topic for the August webinar. So um, I'll be sending out invites for that shortly, but uh, mid-August we'll have Bob Foster and he's going to do a simplified remote restart session for us, okay? So it was nice that you put that in there because I think that there will be a lot of questions. It will help for a lot of questions for next month. So um, th there is a bunch of questions out there, uh, Mike. I don't know if you can see them or not, but uh, probably more than we're going to be able to get through. Um, sure, sure. We're really at the, at the end. Um, and I can send these to you if you want. Um, yeah, no problem. I can always, uh, you know, copy and paste and respond via email, guys. I, I didn't want to run long, but I wanted to make sure that I covered some of the line items in detail. So I apologize yeah. for time, but I was trying to be thorough with, you know, a number of the line items. No, you did, you did a fantastic job, Mike. What I think we'll do is I'll go ahead and save these off and um, and then send them to you if you want to, you know, if you can just put in a, an answer on the ones that are possible and then I can post them on the wiki um, and people can come back and look at them. So I'll be posting the uh, the replay here in, in a couple of days and I'll post these um, as soon as Mike gets them back to me. All right. So given that we're at the end of our time, I think uh, we better just close up here because I want to be respectful. Everybody's got places to go and, and things to do here. So Mike, I really appreciate you doing this. It really was fantastic. I, I know you put the stuff together. Um, for Edge and stuff and kind of pressed you to do it early um, and I really appreciate that. Thanks so much. Not a problem. Thank you guys for your time. Yep. So, so everybody have a great summer um, that now that we're well into it and uh, we'll, you'll be seeing invites from me soon. On um, the next topic, we've got a couple of great topics lined up yet for the next couple months as well. So uh, look for those and with that, we'll say goodbye.